Section 5 of Astounding Stories, March 1930. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Astounding Stories, March 1930. Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings, Chapters 11 through 13. Chapter 11, The Electrical Eavesdropper. I turned from the deck. Miko was near me, so he had dared to show himself here among us. But I realized that he could not be aware we knew he was the murderer. George Prince had been asleep, had not seen Miko with Anita. Miko, with impulsive rage, had shot the girl and escaped. No doubt now he was cursing himself for having done it, and he could very well assume that Anita had died without regaining consciousness to tell who had killed her. He gazed at me now here on the deck. I thought for an instant he was coming over to talk to me. Though he probably considered he was not suspected of the murder of Anita, he realized, of course, that his attack on me was known. He must have wondered what action Captain Carter would take. But he did not approach me. He moved away and went inside. Moa had been near him, and as though by prearrangement with him, she now accosted me. I wish to speak to you, said Haljan. Go ahead. I felt an instinctive aversion for this Martian girl, yet she was not unattractive. Over six feet tall, straight and slim, sleek blonde hair, rather a handsome face, not gray like the burly Miko, but pink and white. Stern-lipped, yet feminine, too. She was smiling gravely now. Her blue eyes regarded me keenly. She said gently, A sad occurrence, Greg Haljan, and mysterious. I would not question you. Is that all you have to say, I demanded, when she paused? No. You are a handsome man, Greg, attractive to women, to any Martian woman. She said it impulsively. Admiration for me was on her face, in her eyes. A man cannot miss it. Thank you. I mean, I would be your friend. My brother Miko is so sorry about what happened between you and him this morning. He only wanted to talk to you, and he came to your cubby door... With a torch to break its seal, I interjected. She waved that away. He was afraid you would not admit him. He told you he would not hurt you. And so he struck me with one of your cursed Martian paralyzing rays? He is sorry. She seemed gauging me, trying, no doubt, to find out what reprisal would be taken against her brother. I felt sure that Moa was as active as a man in any plan that was underway to capture the Grantline treasure. Miko, with his ungovernable temper, was doing things that put their plans in jeopardy. I demanded abruptly, What did your brother want to talk to me about? Me, she said surprisingly. I sent him. A Martian girl goes after what she wants. Did you know that? She swung on her heel and left me. I puzzled over it. Was that why Miko had struck me down and was carrying me off? Was my accursed masculine beauty so attractive to this Martian girl? I did not think so. I could not believe that all these incidents were so unrelated to what I knew was the main undercurrent. They wanted me, had tried to capture me, for something else than because Moa liked my looks. Dr. Frank found me mooning alone. Go to bed, Greg. You look awful. I don't want to go to bed. Where's Snap? I don't know. He was here a while ago. I had not seen him since the burial of Anita. The captain wants him. The surgeon left me. Within an hour, the morning siren would arouse the passengers. I was seated in a secluded corner of the deck when George Prince came along. He went past me, a slight, somber, dark-robed figure. He had on high, thick boots. A hood was over his head, but as he saw me, he pushed it back and dropped down beside me. For a moment, he did not speak. His face showed pallid in the pallid star gleams. She said you loved her. His soft voice was throaty with emotion. Yes, I said it almost against my will. There seemed a bond springing between this bereaved brother and me. He added so softly I could barely hear him. That makes you, I think, almost my friend. And you thought you were my enemy. I held my answer. An incautious tongue running under emotion is a dangerous thing, and I was sure of nothing. He went on. Almost my friend, because we both loved her, and she loved us both. He was hardly more than whispering, and there is aboard one whom we both hate. 
Miko. It burst from me. Yes, but do not say it. Another silence fell between us. He brushed back the black curls from his forehead, and his dark eyes searched mine. Have you an eavesdropping microphone, Haljan? I hesitated. Yes. I was thinking, he leaned closer to me, if in half an hour you could use it upon Miko's cabin, I would rather tell you than the captain or anyone else. The cabin will be insulated, but I shall find a way of cutting off that insulation so that you may hear. So George Prince had turned with us. The shock of his sister's death, himself allied to her murderer, had been too much for him. He was with us. Yet his help must be given secretly. Miko would kill him in an instant if it became known. He had been watchful of the deck. He stood up now. I think that is all. As he turned away, I murmured, but I do thank you. The name set Miko glowed upon the small metal door. It was in a transverse corridor similar to A-22. The corridor was forward of the lounge. It opened off the small circular library. The library was unoccupied and unlighted, dim with only the reflected lights from the nearby passages. I crouched behind a cylinder case. The door of Miko's room was in sight, being some thirty feet away from me. I waited perhaps five minutes. No one entered. Then I realized that doubtless the conspirators were already there. I set my tiny eavesdropper on the library floor beside me, connected its little battery, focused its projector. Was Miko's room insulated? I could not tell. There was a small ventilating grid above the door. Across its opening, if the room were insulated, a blue sheen of radiance would be showing, and there would be a faint hum. But from this distance I could not see or hear such details, and I was afraid to approach closer. Once in the transverse corridor, I would have no place to hide, no way of escape if anyone approached Miko's door, I would be discovered. I threw the current into my little apparatus. I prayed if it met interference that the slight sound would pass unnoticed. George Prince had said he would make opportunity to disconnect the room's insulation. He had evidently done so. I picked up the interior sounds at once. My headphone vibrated with them. And with trembling fingers on the little dial between my knees as I crouched in darkness behind the cylinder case, I synchronized. Johnson is a fool. It was Miko's voice. We must have the passwords. He got them from the helio room. A man's voice. I puzzled over it at first, then recognized it. Rance Rankin. Miko said, He is a fool, walking around this ship as though with letters blazoned on his forehead. Watch me. I need watching. Ha! No wonder they apprehended him. Was George Prince in there? Rankin's voice said, He would have turned the papers over to us. I would not blame him too much. What harm? Oh, I'll release him, Miko declared. What harm? That braying ass did us plenty of harm. He has lost the passwords. Better he had left them in the helio room. Moa was in the room. Her voice said, We've got to have them. The Planetara, upon such an important voyage as this, may be watched. How do we know? It is, no doubt, Rankin said quietly. We ought to have the passwords. When we are in control of this ship... It sent a shiver through me. Were they planning to try and seize the Planetara? Now? It seems so. Johnson undoubtedly memorized them, Moa was saying. When we get him out... Han is to do that at the signal, Miko added. George could do it better, perhaps. And then I heard George Prince for the first time. He murmured, I will try. No need, said Miko. I praise where praise is deserved, and I have little praise for you now, George. I could not see what happened. A look, perhaps which Prince could not avoid giving this man he had come to hate. Miko doubtless saw it, and the Martian's hot temper leaped. Rankin said hurriedly, Stop that! And Moa, Let him alone. Sit down, you fool. I could hear the sound of a scuffle, a blow, a cry half suppressed from George Prince. Then Miko, I will not hurt him, craven coward. Look at him, hating me, frightened. I could fancy George Prince sitting there with murder in his heart, and Miko taunting him. Hates me now because I shot his sister. Moa, hush. I will not. Why should I not say it? I will tell you something else, George Prince. It was not Anita I shot at, but you. I meant nothing for her but love. If you had not interfered... This was different from what we had figured. 
George Prince had come in from his own room, had tried to rescue his sister, and in the scuffle, Anita had taken the shot intended for George. I did not even know I had hit her, Miko was saying. Not until I heard she was dead, he added sardonically. I hoped it was you I had hit, George, and I will tell you this. You hate me no more than I hate you. If it were not for your knowledge of radium ores... Is this a personal wrangle? Rankin interrupted. I thought we were here to plan. It is planned, Miko said shortly. I give orders. I do not plan. I am waiting now for the moment. He checked himself. Moa said, Does Rankin understand that no harm is to come to Greg Haljan? Yes, said Rankin, and Dean. We need them, of course. But you cannot make Dean send messages if he refuses, nor make Haljan navigate. I know enough to check on them, Miko said grimly. They will not fool me, and they will obey me, have no fear. A little touch of sulfuric. His laugh was gruesome. It makes the most stubborn very willing. I wish, said Moa, we had Haljan safely hidden. If he is hurt, killed. So that was why Miko had tried to capture me? To keep me safe so that I might navigate the ship? It occurred to me that I should get Carter at once. A plot to seize the planetara, but when? I froze with startled horror. The diaphragms at my ears rang with Miko's words. I have set the time for now. In two minutes. It seemed to startle both Rankin and George Prince almost as much as I. Both exclaimed, No! No, why not? Everyone is at his post. Prince repeated, No! And Rankin, But can we trust them, the stewards, the crew? Eight of them are our men. You didn't know that, Rankin. They've been aboard the Planetara for several voyages. Oh, this is no quickly planned affair, even though we let you in on it so recently. You and Johnson, by God. I crouched tense. There was a commotion in the stateroom. Miko had discovered that his insulation was cut off. He had evidently leaped to his feet. I heard a chair overturn. And the Martians roar. It's off! Did you do that, Prince? By God, if I thought... My apparatus went suddenly dead as Miko flung on the insulation. I lost my wits in the confusion. I should have instantly taken off my vibrations. There was interference. It showed in the dark space of the ventilator grid over Miko's doorway. A snapping in the air there, a swirl of sparks. I heard with my unaided ears Miko's roar over his insulation. My God, they're listening! The scream of a hand siren sounded from his stateroom. It rang over the ship, his signal. I heard it answered from some distant point, and then a shot, a commotion in the lower corridors. The attack upon the planetara had started. I was on my feet. The shouts of startled passengers sounded, a turmoil beginning everywhere. I stood momentarily transfixed. The door of Miko's stateroom burst open. He stood there with Moa, Rankin, and George Prince crowding behind him. He saw me. You, Greg Haljan. He came leaping at me. Chapter 12, The Weightless Combat I was taken wholly by surprise. There was an instant when I stood numbed, fumbling for a weapon at my belt, undecided whether to run or stand my ground. Miko was no more than twenty feet from me. He checked his forward rush. The light from an overhead tube was on him. I saw in his hand the cylinder projector of his paralyzing ray. I plucked my heat cylinder from my belt and fired without taking aim. My tiny heat beam flashed. I must have grazed Miko's hand. His roar of anger and pain rang out over the turmoil. He dropped his weapon, then stooped to pick it up. But Moa forestalled him. She leaped and seized it. Careful, fool. You promised not to hurt him. A confusion of swift action. Rankin had turned and darted away. I saw George Prince stumbling half in front of the struggling Miko and Moa, and I heard footsteps beside me. A hand gripped me, jerked at me. Over the turmoil, Prince's voice sounded. Greg, Haljan! I recall I had the impression that Prince was frightened. He had half fallen in front of Miko, and there was Miko's voice, Let go of me! And Moa, Come! It was Balch gripping me. Greg, this way, run! Get out of here! He'll kill you with that ray! Miko's ray flashed, but George Prince had knocked at his arm. I did not dare fire again. Prince was in the way. Balch, who was unarmed, shoved me violently back. Greg, the chart room! I turned and ran, with Balch after me. Prince had fallen or been felled by Miko. A flash followed me. Miko's weapon, but again it missed. 
He did not pursue me. He ran the other way, through the port side door of the library. Balch and I found ourselves in the lounge. Shouting, frightened passengers were everywhere. The place was in wild confusion, the whole ship ringing now with shouts. To the chart room, Greg. I called to the passengers. Get back to your rooms. I followed Balch. We ran through the archway to the deck. In the starlight, I saw figures scurrying aft, but none were near us. The deck forward was dim with heavy shadows. The oval window and door of the chart room were blue-yellow from the tube lights inside. No one seemed on the deck there, and then as we approached, I saw, further forward in the bow, the trap door to the cage standing open. Johnson had been released. From one of the chart room windows, a heat ray sizzled. It barely missed us. Balt shouted, Carter, don't! The captain called, Oh, you, Balt, and Haljan! He came out on the deck as we rushed up. His left arm was dangling limp. God, this! He got no further. From the turret overhead, a tiny search beam came down and disclosed us. Blackstone was supposed to be on duty up there, with a course master at the controls. But glancing up, I saw, illumined by the turret lights, the figures of Ab Han in his purple-white robe, and Johnson the purser, and on the turret balcony, two fallen men, Blackstone and the course master. Johnson was training the spotlight on us, and Han fired a Martian ray. It struck Balch beside me. He dropped. Carter was shouting, Inside! Greg, get inside! I stopped to raise up Balch. Another beam came down, a heat ray this time. It caught the fallen Balch full in the chest, piercing him through. The smell of his burning flesh rose to sicken me. He was dead. I dropped his body. Carter shoved me into the chart room. In the small, steel-lined room, Carter and I slid the door closed. We were alone here. The thing had come so quickly it had taken Captain Carter, like us all, wholly unawares. We had anticipated spying eavesdroppers, but not this open brigandage. No more than a minute or two had passed, since Miko's siren in his stateroom had given the signal for the attack. Carter had been in the chart room. Blackstone was in the turret. At the outbreak of confusion, Carter dashed out to see Han releasing Johnson from the cage. From the forward chart room window, now I could see where Han, with a torch, had broken the cage seal. The torch lay on the deck. There had been an exchange of shots. Carter's arm was paralyzed. Johnson and Han had escaped. Carter was as confused as I. There had simultaneously been an encounter up in the turret. Blackstone and the course master were killed. The lookout had been shot from his post in the forward observatory. His body dangled now, twisted half in and half out of his window. We could see several of Miko's men erstwhile members of our crew and steward corps, scurrying from the turret along the upper bridges toward the dark and silent helio room. Snap was up there. But was he? The helio room glowed suddenly with dim light, but there was no evidence of a fight there. The fighting seemed mostly below the deck, down in the hull corridors. A blended horror of sounds came up to us. Screams, shouts, and the hissing and snapping of ray weapons. Our crew, such as them as were loyal, were making a stand down below, but it was brief. Within a minute, it died away. The passengers amidships in the superstructure were still shouting. Then above them, Miko's roar sounded. Be quiet. Go in your rooms. You will not be harmed. The brigands in these few minutes were in control of the ship. All but this little chart room where, with most of the ship's weapons, Carter and I were entrenched. God, Greg, that this should come upon us. Carter was fumbling with the chart room weapons. Here. Greg, help me. What have you got? Heat ray? That's all I had ready. It struck me then, as I helped him make the connections, that Carter in this crisis was at best an inefficient commander. His red face had gone splotchy purple. His hands were trembling. Skilled as captain of a peaceful liner, he was at a loss now. Nor could I blame him. It is easy to say we might have taken warning, done this or that, and come triumphant through this attack. But only the fool looks backwards and says... I would have done better. I tried to summon my wits. The ship was lost to us, unless Carter and I could do something. Our futile weapons. Four or five heat ray hand projectors that could send a pencil ray a hundred feet or so. I shot one diagonally up at the turret where Johnson was leering down at our rear window, but he saw my gesture and dropped back out of sight. The heat beam flashed harmlessly up and struck the turret roof. Then across the turret window came a sheen of radiance, an electro barrage. And behind it, Han's suave, evil face appeared. He shouted down. 
We have orders to spare you, Greg Haljan, or you would have been killed long ago. My answering shot hit his barrage with a shower of sparks, behind which he stood unmoved. Carter handed me another weapon. Greg, try this. I leveled the old explosive bullet projector. Carter crouched beside me, but before I could press the trigger, from somewhere down the starlit deck an electro beam hit me. The little rifle exploded, burst its breech. I sank back to the floor, tingling from the shock of the hostile current. My hands were blackened from the exploding powder. Carter seized me. No use. Hurt? No. The stars through the dome windows were swinging. A long swing. The shadows and starlit patches on the deck were all shifting. The planetara was turning. The heavens revolved in a great round sweep of movement, then settled as we took our new course. Han at the turret controls had swung us. The earth and the sun showed over our bow quarter. The sunlight mingled red-yellow with the brilliant starlight. Han's signals were sounding. I heard them answer from the mechanism rooms down below. Brigands there in full control. The gravity plates were being set to the new positions. We were on our new course. Headed a point or two off the earth line. Not headed for the moon, I wondered. Carter and I were planning nothing. What was there to plan? We were under observation. A Martian paralyzing ray or electronic beam, far more deadly than our own puny police weapons, would have struck us the instant we tried to leave the chart room. My swift running thoughts were interrupted by a shout from down the deck. At a corner of the cabin superstructure, some fifty feet from our windows, the figure of Miko appeared. A barrage radiance hung around him like a shimmering mantle. His voice sounded, Greg Haljan, do you yield? Carter leaped up from where he and I were crouching. Against all reason of safety, he leaned from the low window, waving his ham-like fist. Yield? No, I am in command here, you pirate. Brigand, murderer. I pushed him back. Careful. He was spluttering, and over it Miko's sardonic laugh sounded. Very well, but will you talk? Shall we argue about it? I stood up. What do you want to say, Miko? Behind him, the tall, thin figure of his sister showed. She was plucking at him. He turned violently. I won't hurt him. Greg Hajan, is this a truce? You will not shoot? He was shielding Moa. No, I called. For a moment, no, a truce. What is it you want to say? I could hear the babble of passengers who were herded in the cabin with brigands guarding them. George Prince, bareheaded but shrouded in his cloak, showed in a patch of light behind Moa. He looked my way and then retreated into the lounge archway. Miko called. You must yield. We want you, Haljan. No doubt, I jeered. Alive. It is easy to kill you. I could not doubt that. Carter and I were little more than rats in a trap, here in the chart room. But Miko wanted to take me alive. That was not so simple. He added persuasively, We want you to help us navigate, will you? No. Will you help us, Captain Carter? Tell your cub this Haljan to yield. You are fools. We understand that Haljan has been handling the ship's mathematics. Him we need most. Carter roared. Get back from there. This is no truce. I shoved aside his leveled bullet projector. Wait a minute, I called to Miko. Navigate? Where? Oh, he retorted. That is our business, not yours. When you lay down your weapons and come out of there, I will give you the course. Back to the earth, I suggested. I could fancy him grinning behind the sheen of his barrage at my question. The earth? Yes. Shall we go there? Give me your orders, Greg Haljan. Of course I will obey them. His sardonic words were interrupted. Then I realized that all this parley was a ruse of Miko's to take me alive. He had made a gesture. Han, watching from the turret window, doubtless flashed a signal down to the hull quarters. The magnetizer control under the chart room was altered, our artificial gravity cut off. I felt the sudden lightness. I gripped the window casement and clung. Carter was startled into incautious movement. It flung him out into the center of the chart room, his arms and legs grotesquely flailing. And across the chart room, in the opposite window, I felt rather than saw the shape of something. A figure, almost invisible but not quite, was trying to climb in. I flung the empty rifle I was holding. It hit something solid in the window. In a flare of sparks, a black-hooded figure materialized. A man climbing in. His weapon spat. 
There was a tiny electronic flash, deadly silent. The intruder had shot at Carter, struck him. Carter gave one queer scream. He had floated to the floor, his convulsive movement, when he was hit, hurled him to the ceiling. His body struck, twitched, bounced back, and sank inert on the floor grid almost at my feet. I clung to the casement. Across the space of the weightless room, the hooded intruder was also clinging. His hood fell back. It was Johnson. He leered at me. Killed him, the bully. Well, he deserved it. Now for you, Mr. Third Officer Haljan. But he did not dare fire at me. Miko had forbidden it. I saw him reach under his robe, doubtless for a low-powered paralyzing ray, such as Miko already had used on me. But he never got it out. I had no weapon within reach. I leaned into the room, still holding the casement, and doubled my legs under me. I kicked out from the window. The force catapulted me across the space of the room like a vault plane. I struck the purser. We gripped. Our locked, struggling bodies bounced out into the room. We struck the floor, surged up like balloons to the ceiling, struck it with a flailing arm or a leg, and floated back. Grotesque abnormal combat, like fighting in weightless water. Johnson clutched his weapon, but I twisted his wrist, held his arm outstretched so that he could not aim it. I was aware of Miko's voice shouting on the deck outside. Johnson's left hand was gouging at my face, his fingers plucking at my eyes. We lunged down to the floor, then up again, close to the ceiling. I twisted his wrists. He dropped the weapon and it sank away. I tried to reach it, but could not. Then I had him by the throat. I was stronger than he and more agile. I tried choking him, his thick bull neck within my fingers. He kicked, scrambled, tore and gouged at me, tried to shout, but it ended in a gurgle. And then, as he felt his breath stopped, his hands came up in an effort to tear mine loose. We sank again to the floor. We were momentarily upright. I felt my feet touch. I bent my knees. We sank further. Then I kicked violently upward. Our locked bodies shot to the ceiling. Johnson's head was above me. It struck the steel roof of the chart room, a violent blow. I felt him go suddenly limp. I cast him off, and, doubling my body, I kicked at the ceiling. It sent me diagonally downward to the window, where I clung and regained stability. And I saw Miko standing on the deck, with a weapon leveled at me. Chapter 13, The Torture Haljan, yield or I'll fire. Moa, give me the smaller one. This cursed... He had in his hand too large a projector. Its ray would kill me. If he wanted to take me alive, he would not fire. I chanced it. No. I tried to draw myself beneath the window. An automatic bullet projector was on the floor where Carter had dropped it. I pulled myself down. Miko did not fire. I reached the revolver. The dead bodies of the captain and purser had drifted together on the floor in the center of the room. I hitched myself back to the window. With upraised weapon, I gazed cautiously out. Miko had disappeared. The deck within my line of vision was empty. But was it? Something told me to beware. I clung to the casement, ready upon the instant to shove myself down. There was a movement in a shadow along the deck. Then a figure rose up. Don't fire, Haljan. The sharp command, half appeal, stopped the pressure of my finger on the trigger of the automatic. It was a tall, lanky Englishman, Sir Arthur Coniston, as he called himself. So he, too, was one of Miko's band. The light through a dome window fell full on him. If you fire Haljan and kill me, Miko will kill you then, surely. From where he had been crouching, he could not command my window. But now, upon the heels of his placating words, he abruptly shot. The low-powered ray, had it struck, would have felled me without killing. But it went over my head as I dropped. Its aura made my senses real. Coniston shouted, Haljan! I did not answer. I wondered if he would dare approach to see if I had been hit. A minute passed, then another. I thought I heard Miko's voice on the deck outside, but it was an aerial microscopic whisper close beside me. We see you, Haljan. You must yield. Their eavesdropping vibrations with audible projection were upon me. I retorted aloud, Come and get me. You cannot take me alive. I do protest if this action of mine in the chart room may seem bravado. I had no wish to die. There was within me a very healthy desire for life, but I felt by holding out that some chance might come wherewith I might turn events against these brigands. Yet reason told me it was hopeless. Our loyal members of the crew were killed, no doubt. 
Captain Carter and Balch were killed, the lookouts and course masters also, and Blackstone. There remained only Dr. Frank and Snap. Their fate I did not yet know. And there was George Prince. He perhaps would help me if he could, but at best he was a dubious ally. You are very foolish, Haljan, murmured the projection of Miko's voice. And then I heard Coniston. See here, why would not a hundred pounds of gold leaf tempt you? The code words which were taken from Johnson, I mean to say, why not tell us where they are? So that was one of the brigands' new difficulties. Snap had taken the code word sheet, that time we sealed the purser in the cage. I said, you'll never find them, and when a police ship sights us, what will you do then? The chances of a police ship were slim indeed, but the brigands evidently did not know that. I wondered again what had become of Snap. Was he captured, or still holding them off? I was watching my windows, for at any moment under cover of this talk I might be assailed. Gravity came suddenly to the room. Miko's voice said, We mean well by you, Haljan. There is your normality. Join us. We need you to chart our course. And a hundred pounds of gold leaf, urged Coniston. Or more. Why, this treasure... I could hear an oath from Miko, and then his ironic voice. We will not bother you, Haljan. There is no hurry. You will be hungry in good time, and sleepy. Then we will come and get you, and a little acid will make you think differently about helping us. His vibrations died away. The pull of gravity in the room was normal. I was alone in the dim silence with the bodies of Carter and Johnson lying huddled on the grid. I bent to examine them. Both were dead. My isolation was no ruse this time. The outlaws made no further attack. Half an hour passed. The deck outside, what I could see of it, was vacant. Balch lay dead close outside the chart room door. The bodies of Blackstone and the course master had been removed from the turret window. A forward lookout, one of Miko's men, was on duty in the nearby tower. Han was at the turret controls. The ship was under orderly handling, heading back upon a new course. For the Earth or the Moon, it did not seem so. I found in the chart room a Benson curve light projector, which poor Captain Carter had very nearly assembled. I worked on it, trained it through my rear window, along the empty deck, bent it into the lounge hallway. Upon my grid, the image of the lounge interior presently focused. The passengers in the lounge were huddled in a group. Disheveled, frightened, with Moa standing watching them. Stewards were serving them with a meal. Upon a bench, bodies were lying. Some were dead. I saw Rance Rankin. Others were evidently only injured. Dr. Frank was moving among them, attending them. Venza was there unharmed, and I saw the gamblers, Shack and Dud, sitting white-faced, whispering together and Glutz's little be-ribboned, be-curled figure on a stool. George Prince was there, standing against the wall, shrouded in his morning cloak, watching the scene with alert, roving eyes. And by the opposite doorway, the huge, towering figure of Miko stood on guard. But Snap was missing. A brief glimpse. Miko saw my Benson light. I could have equipped a heat ray and fired along the curved Benson light into that lounge. But Miko gave me no time. He slid the lounge door closed, and Moa leaped to close the one on my side. My light was cut off. My grid showed only the blank deck and door. Another interval. I had made plans. Futile plans. I could get into the turret, perhaps, and kill Han. I had the invisible cloak which Johnson was wearing. I took it from his body. Its mechanism could be repaired. Why, with it, I could creep about the ship, kill these brigands one by one, perhaps. George Prince would be with me. The brigands who had been posing as the stewards and crew members were unable to navigate. They would obey my orders. There were only Miko, Coniston, and Han to kill. Feudal plans. From my window, I could gaze up into the helio room, and now abruptly I heard Snap's voice. No, I tell you no. And Miko. Very well, we will try this. So Snap was captured but not killed. Relief swept me. He was in the helio room, and Miko was with him. But my relief was short-lived. After a brief interval, there came a moan from Snap. It floated down from the silence overhead. It made me shudder. My Benson beam shot into the helio window. It showed me Snap lying there on the floor. He was bound with wire. His torso had been stripped. His livid face was ghastly plain in my light. Miko was bending over him. Miko with a heat cylinder no longer than a finger. 
its needle beam played upon Snap's naked chest. I could see the gruesome little trail of smoke rising, and as Snap twisted and jerked, there in his flesh was the red and blistered trail of the violet hot ray. Now will you tell? No. Miko laughed. No, that I shall write my name a little deeper. A black scar now, a trail etched in the quivering flesh. Oh! Snap's face went white as chalk as he pressed his lips together. Or a little acid? This fire writing does not really hurt? Tell me what you did with those code words. No. In his absorption, Miko did not notice my light nor did I have the wit to try and fire along it. I was trembling. Snap under torture. As the beam went deeper, Snap suddenly screamed, but he ended, No, I will send no message for you. It had been only a moment. In the chart room window beside me, again a figure appeared. No image, a solid living person, undisguised by any cloak of invisibility. George Prince had chanced my fire and had crept up upon me. Haljan, don't attack me. I dropped my light connection. As impulsively I stood up, I saw through the window the figure of Coniston on the deck watching the result of Prince's venture. Haljan, yield. Prince no more than whispered it. He stood outside on the deck. The low window casement touched his waist. He leaned over it. He's torturing Snap. Call out that you will yield. The thought had already been in my mind. Another scream from Snap chilled me with horror. I shouted, Miko, stop. I rushed to the window, and Prince gripped me. Louder! I called louder. Miko, stop! My upflung voice mingled with Snap's agony of protest. Then Miko heard me. His head and shoulders showed up there at the helio room oval. You, Haljan? Prince shouted. I have made him yield. He will obey you if you stop that torture. I think that poor Snap must have fainted. He was silent. I called. Stop! I will do what you command. Miko jeered. That is good. A bargain if you and Dean obey me. Disarm him, Prince, and bring him out. Miko moved back into the helio room. On the deck, Coniston was advancing, but cautiously mistrustful of me. Greg. George Prince flung a leg over the casement and leaped lightly into the dim chart room. His small, slender figure stood beside me, clung to me. Greg. A moment while we stood there together. No ray was upon us. Coniston could not see us, nor could he hear our whispers. Greg. A different voice, its throaty, husky quality gone, a soft pleading. Greg. Greg, don't you know me, Greg, dear? Why, what was this? Not George Prince? A masquerader, yet so like George Prince. Greg, don't you know me? Clinging to me, a soft touch upon my arm. Fingers clinging. A surge of warm, tingling current was flowing between us. My sweep of instant thoughts, a speck of human earth dust falling free. That was George Prince who had been killed. George Prince's body, disguised by the scheming Carter and Dr. Frank, buried in the guise of his sister. And this black-robed figure who was trying to help us, Anita, dear God, Anita, darling, Anita, Greg, dear one, Anita, dear God, my arms went around her. My list pressed hers and felt her tremulous, eager answer. Greg, dear. Anita, you. The form of Coniston showed at our window. She cast me off. She said with her throaty swagger of assumed masculinity, I have him, Sir Arthur. He will obey us. I sensed her warning glance. He shoved me toward the window. She said ironically, Have no fear, Haljan. You will not be tortured, you and Dean, if you obey our commands. Coniston gripped me. You fool, you caused us a lot of trouble, didn't you? Move along there. He jerked me roughly through the window, marched me the length of the deck, out to the stern space, opened the door of my cubby, flung me in, and sealed the door upon me. Miko will come presently. I stood in the darkness of my tiny room, listening to his retreating footsteps. But my mind was not on him. All the universe in that instant had changed for me. Anita was alive. To be continued. End of Brigands of the Moon by Ray Cummings. Chapters 11 through 13. Recording by Alan Winteroud. Audio.boomcoach.com.